Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is double stars. And our guest is one of the members of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, Mr. Jim Frisbee. Jim, welcome to the program. Don, thank you for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure, very, pleasure to be here. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Now, we'll start right off with asking you, why do you like observing double stars? Well, Don, one of the reasons about uh, why I like double stars is um, I can do it from my driveway. Many aspects of astronomy, you need to be in a dark sky area, but with double star observing, um, you can do that in a suburban area uh, very easily with um, a telescope, naked eye, or a pair of binoculars. So you don't have to drive hours to a dark sky site. Exactly. All I do is roll my telescope out in the driveway, and I'm good to go. But it also gives me a chance to uh, learn the sky and to uh, test my equipment to make sure it's operating correctly and um, you know, an overall chance to learn more about astronomy. Now when you mentioned learn the sky, I get the impression that you don't use a go-to scope. Um, that's one of my challenges. I had a go-to scope and um, I put it aside because I was getting out under the stars. Uh, it was in Vail, Colorado and uh, I got lost. There was so much detail in the sky and I didn't have the markers I needed and my telescope wasn't going to so consequently um, I was at a disadvantage so um, I decided I wanted to learn the sky and one way to do that was to put the go-to away. And just star hop as they say. Yes. Understand where the constellations were okay. and when they'd be up and uh, know what they look like. Now you mentioned a go-to scope that you put aside what types of equipment do you need to observe double stars? Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it's, it's a very uh, simplistic uh, approach. You don't have to be complicated with observing double stars. Some stars, like uh, Mizar and Elkar, can be seen uh, naked eye. Um, other stars need a pair of binoculars, uh, like Albirio, and um, uh, with an 80 millimeter telescope, a very small telescope, you can do a lot of double star observing. Now with using the binoculars, would you recommend a tripod versus handheld? Well, uh, yes and no, okay? Uh, no from the standpoint that it limits your flexibility and where you can look from in the sky and how fast you can get there. Uh, many binoculars are straight through binoculars and to look at the zenith, it becomes very difficult on a tripod. Um, so that's the no part. The yes part is um, when you're observing double stars, the better concentration you can form, um, the, the more you can see. And um, uh, in my experience with uh, binoculars, if they're stabilized, uh, I can use them very comfortably. But if I have to hand hold them, I'm limited to my ability to uh, you know, hold them still. And okay. one of the tricks I use is I put my fingers against my forehead to try and stabilize so that the uh, binoculars in my eyes become one. Now with a telescope, would you say a refractor, a, a telescope with a lens is better than a reflector, one with a mirror? Uh, they both uh, will serve well in doing that. All right. Now, uh, what is the best known double star? Well, you heard me leak it a moment ago, okay. and that's Mizar and Elkar. Uh, the ancient Arabs used to use it as uh, a test of visual acuity, um, and so did the uh, native Indians. If a brave could uh, stand up and separate Mizar and Elkar, uh, naked eye, uh, they said, you know, he passed the eye test. Uh, the, the image that we have up right now on the screen at the moment, Mizar is the middle star in the handle? Yes, the hip in the handle. And um, Mizar itself, is a double star, but you need a telescope to separate that. The one you would see then with the naked eye or pair of binoculars would be Mizar and El Cor. That's correct. Very close yes. star to it. Um, and you mentioned that Mizar is itself a double. Yes. Uh, are there any other types of uh, doubles that can be detected with the naked eye, or is that pretty much it? Um, uh, when you, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, Don. Um, what I do in an observing session is I do my planning up front as to 
you know, time of day, time of year, time of month. And uh, I um, try and plan what's up in the sky. Okay. Uh, for instance, one of my favorite constellations for this time of year is Orion. And there are many doubles in Orion. In fact, uh, virtually half the stars you can see in the sky are um, double stars. Um, in Orion, uh, you could plan an evening's observing and um, uh, outline several different stars with multiple components in um, uh, different separations and use different instruments to, uh, to view them. Now, there are, are several types or varieties, if you will, of double stars. Can you... Uh... Tell our viewers what those are. Yes, we have um, we have some definitions that uh, are going to show up here. Um, an optical double star, Don, is something that you can uh, visually uh, separate. Okay, uh, but an optical double star is not gravitationally related. It's just uh, they look from Earth like they're close together, okay. but they might be light years apart. Sort of just a line of sight. Um, yes. Okay. Now, uh, in a binary double star, there's a gravitational effect, um, and one uh, affects the other because of how close they are together, both, uh, you know, longitudinally and uh, laterally, okay. okay? So they actually spin. And then there's a third type? Yes. The, uh, the third type is a visual uh, binary star, and those are the ones that you can separate with some kind of instrument, either it be your eye, a pair of binoculars, or a telescope. Okay, so we have those three uh, types, basic types, uh, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Don, yeah. some, some stars are so close together that uh, you can't visually separate them, and it takes uh, sophisticated instrumentation to be able to analyze uh, the fact that they are double stars. So we couldn't split them no. With, with this, the equipment that you're no. talking about. We run into problems with um, visu visual acuity, the capabilities of the instrument that you're using, and scene conditions. In other words, um, how much is the atmosphere moving around, and how easily can I observe the star? Kind of gets to our next question, I think, with uh, there's the theory about splitting double stars, and then there's the reality. Yes, Don. Performance is a function of the diameter of the telescope, um, focal length, and uh, there's a formula called Dawes limit that um, has a constant in it, and it's you know complicated voodoo stuff. But basically, what it says with an eight-inch telescope, you can resolve a star, a double star pair that's a half an x, half an arc second apart. So we have the image up here on the. Uh... Yes, the screen. Um, you, and uh, uh, separation, uh, you see in the drawing, you have the, uh, the two elements of um, the double star pair, and that's considered uh, being able to split the star. Um, there's also another constraint called uh, exit pupil diameter, and humans are, have uh, only the ability to get enough light through if the exit pupil is eight-tenths of a millimeter or larger. So um, there's, you know, there's a certain limit of magnification that you can use with any telescope and still be able to see and actuate the uh, elements in your eye. Now, this is the theory, but we're observing in reality, so how does that all work out? Well, um, I can talk about uh, one of my favorite pairs, and that is Albirio. Um, they are uh, visible with binoculars, splittable with binoculars, but there's a, a, they call it the University of Michigan star. It has a maze portion and a blue portion. Um, the primary is maze, the secondary is blue, and um, you uh, go to uh, north, and you can from there determine the uh, angle of the separation, and uh, with a micrometer, you can measure the actual distance apart of the two, uh, two elements. And uh, you can also perceive the color. Color is okay. very apparent in that double collection. Now, as we're out observing in the real world, we have atmosphere between us and the star. I assume the atmosphere would uh, dampen down the, the well, ideal from Dawes that, limit. That's another aspect of uh, uh, limitations for observing. Like right now, we have a situation with the front coming in 
and it's not a good time for double star observing because the atmosphere is so disturbed. All right. Well, we uh, hope you've enjoyed this first part of our discussion on observing double stars. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you have a question for us about double stars or really anything that you uh, see here on the show, or maybe you have a question that you haven't seen us address here on the show, please send us an email. Uh, the address is down at the bottom of your screen. And right after term of the month with Stephen Whitty, we'll be back with more of our discussion on observing double stars. The term of the month for April 2014 is Algol. Algol is a binary star, but it's an unusual binary star. It's also a variable star. In fact, it's an eclipsing bi binary star. One of the stars, as it goes around the other, one of the stars is dimmer than the other, and when it goes in front of the brighter star, the star dims a little bit. So normally, most of the time, Algol is about as bright as Polaris, the North Star, which isn't terribly nearby, but um, bear with me. Uh, for about two hours, every 2.8 days, like clockwork, uh, the one star goes in front of the other star, and it dims, and it turns out that it dims to a nearby star's uh, brightness. So let's bring up the chart. So in the chart, uh, we're looking to the northwest. You can see the N is north to the right there. Cassiopeia, the constellation, is the W. It's really easy to spot. Um, in Perseus, Murfak is the brightest star, and almost directly below it is Algol. And below that is Mu Persei, which is uh, about as bright as Algol dims to when it gets a chance to dim. So look up Algol on, in, in Google you can look up Algol and Sky and Telescope, and you'll get a uh, a chart, you'll get actually a little application where you can get times when this dimming occurs, since it's every 2.8 days, and it even tries to guess where you live and therefore what time zone you're in. Uh, that did a pretty good job for me. So, term of the month for April is Algol. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back to our discussion on double stars. Our guest this month is Jim Frisbee, a fellow member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club. Now, earlier, Jim, we talked about using binoculars as some of the equipment for uh, observing double stars. And you feel that binoculars have a very important place? Yes, they do, Don. Uh, they add and bring in a dimension that you can't um, see with one eye. And that is um, your brain becomes involved between uh, what each eye is perceiving. Sometimes uh, you might be able to resolve the image in your right eye. Other times you might uh, resolve it in your left eye and not in your right eye, but your brain puts all that together. And uh, what happens is you, uh, with binoculars, you get twice as much light, so your cones are able to uh, perceive color better. And uh, the whole thing adds up to uh, more resolution uh, when your brain gets involved. All right, and uh, I understand that you have a, there was a particular quote that... Uh... Yes, the quote that was up on the screen is one that uh, I, I kind of like and have included in other presentations I've had, but basically uh, I paraphrase that in describing to you what's going on. The uh, author of that is uh, Mike Reynolds. All right, very good. <clears throat> now, when you plan an observing session, uh, what are the steps that you take in doing that? Well, uh, each person probably plans, you know, the way they want to. Uh, you heard me mention Orion earlier. This uh, slide that's up now uh, talks about uh, Orion, what targets are available, where it is in the sky, and the characteristics of each star. And then I uh, take a, a note or two as to um, whether I could split it, how well I could split it, what instrument that I use to, to split it with. Um, that's uh, part of what I do up front. Okay. So I might spend as much time planning as I actually do observing. I see. Uh, now we've talked about a couple of different types of double stars. We talked about Mizar and Elcor, which is 
quite easy to see. We can split that with our naked eye. Are all double stars equally easy to see? No, no. Uh, that's why um, the, um, the visual aspect, the binoculars and the telescope come into play. Okay. Um, there are computer programs that are available where you can uh, set the uh, relative intensity of the magnitude of the two stars and the distance apart. And with that program, you can calculate a relative index of how difficult it is to separate that particular star. And the image we have right here would be one of those uh, software <clears throat> yes, programs? Yes, that's an image of a, a program. It's called the LADIC calculator, and a very simplistic program, but uh, it does help you uh, quantify how easy the stars are to split. Now, using that obviously as an aid to help you plan, out in the field, what type of aids do you use, uh, accessories for equipment and uh, that sort of thing? Well, um, one of the things I use is um, um, a reflex sight. It's called a Telrad, and um, uh, that um, allows me to be able to look up in the sky and move my telescope to where um, the uh, star will come right down the, in, the, in the center of the eyepiece, and it's, it's a very easy and friendly device to use. Um, in addition, um, I might use um, uh, different aids up front in terms of um, uh, some st stuff I, I look at um, with a um, uh, red light. Okay so that I can uh, find the stars on a chart, on a star chart. Okay. But um, I also use uh, specific eyepieces. University Optics uh, makes uh, a very good flat field eyepiece that uh, works well for me uh, in double star observing. And uh, there are other types of uh, illuminated reticles that you might use to? Uh... Well, um, after you've used the Telrad, you can also uh, use a finder scope Okay. Um, and there's one up on the screen now. Uh, that particular one is illuminated, and um, you see uh, calibration marks around the circumference, and it shows, um, helps you with determining angular separation, and then um, also uh, where where the star is in the sky and where uh, the primary component is in relationship to the others. All right, and then uh, we talked. Earlier you had your notes for your planning. Is, is there an actual log then that you keep of your observations that you do? Well, uh, for future reference, one of the things I do is uh, I keep track of my observing session. Uh, the slide that's up now shows you uh, Sigma Orion. Uh, it's one of my favorites. There's four elements that are easily visible, and uh, that log shows how far they were apart and uh, what instrument I use to uh, observe them and an assessment of overall scene conditions and a description of, you know, the whole cluster in itself. And you would do this for each double star that you would look at? Yes, and I also do it um, as a test of a piece of equipment. If I buy a new telescope, I bring it out from behind the couch and put it on a mount and uh, evaluate how easily I can split stars with it versus another piece of equipment that you use that right. you had this record on. And I have the log. I can call up the log and then uh, compare how well I did with each scope. All right. So this way, it's a good way to, uh, to compare. Do you use a paper log or do you use uh, something on a computer or a tablet? Or? I uh, use a paper log. Okay. <laughs> We're still, they want to call it old school, but it still works for me. Yeah. Now, what about Observe, are there special clubs? I know we have the Ford Club, which has a wide range of interests, but are there special clubs just for observing double stars? Yes. Um, there um, are groups, uh, and with the uh, Internet, it's very easy to uh, be able to find people of similar interests. And uh, there are several organizations that focus on splitting stars. And um, one in particular, it's called the Spirit of 33, and what they do is try and identify 33 double stars in any constellation. And then uh, they'll post uh, online performance of individuals in being able to split each of the 33 stars in the, uh, in the selection for the month. Okay. But there's also uh, a club 
that sponsors um, different awards related to double star observing. So uh, let's say you found uh, 100 double stars that are on that list. Uh, you could submit uh, and receive uh, a wallpaper to, uh, you know, award you for the effort. Okay, is that through the Astronomical League, I'm, I'm thinking? Um, yes, I, I believe it is. Okay, all right. So we have that, and there's the online activities uh, yes. that you mentioned there. And in addition, of course, there's uh, clubs like our own. Somebody or several other people may have that same interest in double stars. And uh, you could have that one-on-one -on -one personal interaction, which is yes. always a good thing as well. And like I say, it, 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 because you can do it at home in a suburban area, there's a lot of people that are involved with it. Again, you don't have to put in that great distance to drive to the dark sky Correct. site to Correct. see that 13th magnitude uh, nebula. And, and uh, my, uh, a good portion of my interest is in astrophotography, but to do that, I have to be some distance out in the dark sky area. So this allows me to be at home and observe, and it doesn't take the travel time or you know, staying overnight right. to uh, be able to exercise the hobby. All right, I would really like to thank our guest, uh, Jim Frisbee from the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club for uh, filling us in on uh, observing double stars. Uh, if you uh, would like to get more information, please visit our website. Uh, we're going to put up the web address down at the bottom of your screen. Before I throw to uh, Stephen for what's up in our night sky, I do want to take a minute to uh, let you know about International Astronomy Day, which is coming up this year, 2014, on Saturday, May the 10th. Now, our club, the Ford Club, will be conducting events at two different locations here in Southeast Michigan. We'll be doing observing of the sun uh, using safe solar filters to view not only sunspots, but in some of the scopes that are specially equipped, uh, both flares and prominences. Uh, the first of these two locations is at Kensington Metro Park, and within the park it'll be at the Nature Center there. The second location will be at the Michigan Science Center, which is located in Midtown Detroit, right there on East Warren Avenue, just behind the DIA. We'll be having scopes out on the sidewalk so you can access that activity either before you go into the Science Center or once you leave. Uh, again, this is coming up on Saturday, May 10th of this year, so we hope you can make it to either of those two locations to uh, celebrate and participate with us in Astronomy Day. And, and now, Don, without any other further ado, yes, Jim? Don, thank you for inviting me. I, oh, it was very enjoyable. Okay, I'm glad you were here. i glad we could finally get you on the show. It's, uh, we'll have to do this again thank you. real soon. And... Uh, now, if Stephen's ready, we can head off to what's up in the night sky.
What's up in the night sky for April 2014? Sunrise this month is around 7 a.m. Sunset is around 8 p.m. Uh, on the 3rd of April, the moon passes through the constellation Taurus, and it passes through the, um, the cluster of stars called the, the Hades. And uh, it looks to me like this will be, for northern um, uh, United States, this will be an evening sort of thing, maybe 10, 11 p.m. The Sky and Telescope magazine uh, uh, website has when to look um, and exactly where the moon will be going through. But you'll get to see stars getting occulted by the moon, so it will disappear and then reappear on the other side. It's very cool. The moon phases for April. On the 7th, we have the first quarter. On the 15th, the moon is full. The 22nd has the third quarter, and we won't see the new moon on the 28th, but that's when the new moon is. Mars and the moon and Saturn form more or less a straight line uh, on April 15th. That's tax day. Uh, Mars has its opposition on the 8th of April. Uh, Saturn has it next month, but both Saturn and Mars are essentially up all night. Um, if you, if you look above, uh, above Mars, uh, you know, you have Spica below Mars, you have uh, the star, you, you know, up that straight line, there's Vesta. And Vesta is an asteroid, it has uh, its opposition on the 13th, so it's up all night. And Ceres is nearby it, again, the Sky and Telescope uh, finer charts will be great for Vesta and Ceres, which are great binocular objects. So Google will get you there, um, Sky and Telescope and Vesta, for example. Jupiter is, we're losing Jupiter. Jupiter is setting in the west just before sunset. So it's in Gemini, and you can see to the upper left of Gemini, you can see Cancer. Uh, bright Procyon is probably the only real s star you'll see in uh, Canis Minor, the little dog. So, and above that, and to the left of Gemini, you have Cancer, which from suburban uh, locations isn't that visible. It has some great objects in it, but it, the stars themselves are not very bright. On the 22nd of April, we have the Lyrid meteor shower. Uh, these meteor showers are best in the morning. Uh, the Lyrid meteor shower should peak in the morning. We expect typically around 20 per hour, but we can be surprised sometimes with more, uh, more activity. Um, we do have the third quarter moon in the, in the morning, so um, the, that will wash out uh, some of the meteors as well. So, but dress up real warm and uh, be comfortable. You don't need any equipment except maybe a blanket. Uh, uh, meteor showers are really cool. So that's what's up in the night sky for April 2014. Keep looking up. It's the best free show above your head every single night. Mm -hmm.